Marvin here from Blacktop Banter. Uh, really quick, just wanted to talk about the 800 pavement network. As you can see, uh, we have some lettering there. Uh, lettering on our other truck over there. Lettering on this truck here. They all say 1-800 Blacktop. We've been using the 1-800 Blacktop number here for the last couple years. It's really been exceptional for us as far as making things click with our branding and now that we're in another state, those area codes are together. It's worked out fantastically for us. The other thing is that 800 Payment Network has other advantages. There's group discounts on a lot of the products and materials that we use within our industry. We're part of over 300 different, see that one? Over 300 different contractors that are now using these numbers. Um, all over the country. That's combined over $2 billion in gross profits. So if you've been thinking about it or you're curious about it and you're like, well, no, should I or shouldn't I? DM me, message me, or reach out to 800 Payment Network. You can find them online through their website. You can call 1-800-PAVEMENT and you'll get them as well. They'd be happy to run you through kind of the advantages and everything else that we've been taking advantage of here at Wiscoat and Abuke Asphalt Maintenance and how it can benefit you as well. Once again, if you're curious about it at all, you can always DM me. See that? 1-800 Black Cup. You can DM me or message me or email me through the podcast or Wiscoat or wherever as well. I would love to talk to you about how it has helped us. Hey, everybody. Welcome back. This is another episode of Black Top Banter, and this is episode 82. We have had, you guys have had the pleasure of just me doing some solo ones here the last few weeks, and now we're going to be switching gears a little bit, have a good line of guests coming, and I know you guys followed along to, with my recent visit out to Ohio for the Downhill Skate, which covered Street Luge and Downhill Skate, of course, and after that, we all right, I was supposed to some content, and uh, I connected with this guy on the interwebs, as some of the older people in our industry would say, and it was like, dude, yeah, let's totally have a conversation, so uh, without any further ado, I want to introduce the 2017 Street Luge World Champion, Ryan Farmer. Ryan? Hey, everybody. Happy to be here. Super excited for what you all do. Um, it has a big uh, impact for what I do, and I think that's really important. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, you guys are running on us, you know, like, literally the guys that put the blacktop in so tell us a little bit more about yourself and your career uh i'm a totally a big fan of your photography that that i get to see um reg regularly now that i follow you and, and do everything as an observationist of the world myself but tell us a little bit just about where you're at what you do and then we'll dig into like how this all got to this point yeah so um I'm uh, 29 years old, and I started riding downhill about 11 or 12 years ago, um, and it just started out just commuting and bombing the local hill and uh, meeting this amazing community that uplifted me, and, and I kind of opened my eyes to this whole sport that exists that I had no idea about, and um, there, there's a lot of small communities around, but there's also this amazing worldwide community of downhill skateboarders and street luge riders, and um, yeah, it's been a good excuse to travel. Uh, it's been something that has pushed me to be my best in every aspect of my life, which I think is you know, really important. And also really helped me focus on what makes me happy. Oh, cool. And that's kind of where, where photography has came into play is I go to these events and there's great photographers around all over the place. And I'm really thankful for them. What they do is important. And I just was the person with a little point and shoot film camera and documenting what I saw, you know, the, the cool little things on the street corner, the local people, my side of things that weren't necessarily to turn into a magazine cover, but it turns out that people really enjoy seeing things through my eyes as well, which is awesome. <laughs> um, yeah, and I've just been able to plug in and help other people get into the sport and dial in their setups and talk about the good roads and the bad roads and everything in between. So where, you know, where are you located at? I mean, when we say, yeah, we were just out here bombing the hills. I mean, some of these places across America are flatland and you're driving a while to get to some hills. Um, where are you at? Where are you, where are you located at? So I grew up in Southern California um, in the LA Metro. And then I moved up to Northern California once I was tired of the rat race. You know, I was an aerospace machinist. 
making parts for some really large companies. And, uh, and I loved it. It was awesome. And it supported my travels while I was really serious about racing. Not that I'm not serious now, but I was doing a lot of world tours and, you know, really investing quite a significant amount of money. Whereas now I'm focused on the things that bring me joy, the local events that I can attend within my budget. And, uh, and quite amazingly, I still managed to qualify for Team USA. So I'm going to be headed down to Argentina for the World Skate Games coming up next month. Man, that's pretty epic. And I've noticed, uh, you know, just by me kind of being able to step my foot in the community a little bit this last year, that that's generating quite a, bu quite a buzz. Like there's a really, there's a lot of really good people, like not just great competitors, right? But they're just really damn good people. And it's like, dude, I totally want to see these people enjoy moments so much right because i got to see it a little bit in ohio like even people that were like uh, uh i made a really good friend uh fred laberge and he was like he come down he's like you know he's french canadian he's like marvin i made the final i made the final and I, i'm like dude congratulations he's like i'm so excited we're getting beers you know and it was just <laughs> like it was like Dude, dude, to see that kind of excitement and then to see somebody in the butt board final um, take third that had no idea that they were even going to be that close and be so excited. It was like, dude, I can't remember I was when I was part of something that was so gratifying. Like, like it was just was so gratifying seeing all that. So I completely understood then that when, when you mentioned, hey, you know, I want to help people in this community, uh, enjoy the community, understand the community, join the community and, and all that as well. Let's kind of talk about um, your career a little bit, right? And kind of, you know, what, like you said, you qualified for the World Skate Games, but what was it like leading up to the World Championship as well? And then um, even now going into the Skate Games, I know California, from what I understand, has kind of its own scene inside of the national scene, inside of the international scene. Am I right about that? Yeah, California is huge, as we all know. So I mean, from where I used to live to where I live now is about a 14 hour drive. Um, and there's all these small communities that kind of build it together. And then there's a California outlaw racing scene, where we just go out into the middle of nowhere, we close down a road and race down it for a weekend. And it is such a supportive event system that gets people in at all different base intro levels. Um, and the tracks are still challenging for even the best racers. So it's really fun to see people come out, be introduced to this community like you have been, and then support them as they build their skills up where they're able to compete or not compete. A lot of people just like going down the hill and having fun, and they're not interested in this serious high pressure situations. Yeah, yeah, I've noticed that, right? Like uh, when, when the event I went to, like the top three, they were hungry, right? And then you'd see the guys that were like, maybe 30 seconds behind 20 seconds behind even more they'd, they'd hit a corner and they'd be going Woo! yeah right? and it's like dude there's like there's no sad place to finish when you're enjoying yeah, yourself no, that much dude it was it was fantastic and i think it makes it like it makes it very unique i don't know that i've i've encountered a sport like that i don't think right yeah you know when i got into the the community it was a lot of local stuff and i mean 2016 I was racing local events. I was doing well. I was supported by some really fast riders. And then suddenly I had a, a drive to get out of the big city. And I figured I'm going to do a world tour and chase points for the International Downhill Federation and see how I stand against the best. And I reached out and I was really lucky. And I got a couple of sponsors that committed and saw, you know, the bright side of what I was doing and, and decided to invest in it. And I was able to go to 14 countries in 2017. And if you asked me in 2016, where I would be a year later, being a world champion was totally not even on my radar. And, <laughs> um, and you know what, I, I, I traveled, I, I, I had a couple pretty bad crashes right off the bat. And I learned real quick, you know, um, what was important to me, and, and enjoying the ride along the way, enjoying these countries, these people, the experiences in every place. Um, and yeah, I mean, I had a couple world championship wins. I had a couple world cup wins and qualifier wins. And, uh, and it all came down to the final event in Killington, uh, Vermont. So that was after 14 countries, 
and points were so incredibly tight that if I got second place, I wouldn't have been a world champion. That's wild. And, and, and believe it or not, Colby Parks, who you know, uh, we both ended up in finals. We came all the way down the hill, and he almost got me in the final corner because he is a wild and really talented rider. And uh, I was able to win by just a, you know, a meter or two and, and pulled it off. And, and what that kind of did for me was not only put my name on a piece of plastic, you know, I had a trophy that said world champion and that was great, but it showed me that if I, if I set these goals and I kind of focus on what I want in life, that regardless if it's downhill skateboarding or happiness or career paths, um, any of these things can be surprisingly obtainable. And I think that I wouldn't have been anywhere in that mindset if it wasn't for downhill skateboarding and street luge. Dude, I think that that's a general vibe that I've caught, right? Like, yeah. like completely, it's not like it's like just this laissez-faire kind of thing. Like you guys are moving. Like and it's not that you're like absolutely incredibly protected where you can just send it and have no fear like (laughs) right like like it's i I think that just the fact sometimes that you get down the hill right is like this incredibly uplifting adrenaline pumping thing to where you you love it so there's a really unique combination there because the community is so supportive right and so enjoyable of all of each other that like i said there's not very much despair whether you're at the tail end of the pack or you're at the front and it just creates a general love i think for the sport because i didn't see very many people at all of all the downhill skate competitors um and street loose competitors when i was in ohio that had a frown about anything (laughs) <laughs> on the hill right like coming down like it wasn't any of that so it's 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 a very unique thing and i think that like you said it opens up something this unique sport this unique community it opens up something that allows you to see what's capable right mm-hmm. of beyond that and there's not too many things that are that are I guess, how do I want to put that? Where we are, street loose and downhill skate doesn't exist. Like there's no, yeah. scene. there's, there's it's nothing. Sport. Nobody right. knows what we do. Right. So, so it makes me think like how many unique and different things are out there that are the key component for somebody to all of a sudden realize, well, this is just a gateway for me to really enjoy life and discover things about myself and how the world can work and how a person's personal legend, I always love to say personal legend because I, I read The Alchemist a lot. And, um, you know, how you find that and how you get on that path and how that feels for somebody. Dude, there's totally guys there that were, you know, they're gray, man. They've been there a while. I was lucky enough uh, while I was out there to meet uh, Bob Schwartz. And he was yeah. like, dude, he was he loves it. He just loves it loves to be around it, loves to talk about it, just loves it. And he was like, this is my thing. <laughs> like this is Which my is funny because that man has done incredible things in his life. Oh, but yet yeah. the, the thing that he's most stoked about is riding his street luge with a literal rocket attached to it at like 120 miles an hour down a drag strip. Yeah. And that is so incredibly cool. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. And I mean, to me, I think about like, what if it didn't exist then? what would Bob Schwartz be? Right. And then you think about it, like maybe you think about with Ryan Farmer himself now, like how would that be? If, if podcasting didn't exist, I would still be making blacktop black and being like, why the heck don't I enjoy my life so much? Like, what am I not doing? Right. That's not letting me enjoy this. I wonder how many of those different types of things there are. Like, you know, there's so many mainstream ones, right. Hey, get into football or get into soccer or join chess club or whatever the heck it is but there's so many of these variations of different things that everybody should try i think that gets them into it and gets them into the scene i think a big part of it is the mentality too you know it's not just that these little sports or little activities change our lives it's the mentality of wow i'm doing something for me you know so like we can go out to the work grind all day long and work hard and sweat and put in the time and support our families and these really important things that we need to be doing but if we do it with an open mindset of 
who am I going to meet today? What flower am I going to look at on the way to work? You know, what smell other than burning black tar am I going to be smelling at work? <laughs> yeah. You know, if we can slow down and recognize these little things, it really can open up our life and enlighten us a lot more, I think. Yeah, I think so too. And I, you know, that's why I comment about your photography. Those moments, those seconds that you capture are like windows into what's real in the world, right? Because the repetition yeah. of everything we see every day becomes almost numbing. So, right. Mm -hmm. So you, you get to capture a moment and you're like, oh yeah, that exists during the day, during the moment. If I would just stop and look at it for just a second. Right. And yeah. sometimes it just means bringing awareness and things to it. And that's kind of, I know you and I were talking beforehand, so I'm going to segue this uh, into it, but um, I was talking to you about how, when I was at Ohio, I had an affection for the way the urethane wheels sounded on the pavement coming down the hill, right? Like of my day, of anything I seen, did, of any senses, and that's that hardly ever happens to me, that sound through my ears was my favorite moment. And I would sometimes just stop and not even film, not record, not do anything, just wait for that to come. That that was a crazy thing because any you know anybody, if they've watched any of the content or anything, those are blind corners, some of them that I was around. So I didn't know who was coming, when they were coming, whatever. The only anticipation I had was that that sound. Um, and those were the moments during my time there where I was like, oh, this is so enjoyable. Like, yeah. Knowing what's going on, that kind of stuff. So let's talk about that a little bit, because I noticed that different parts of that track were there, whether there was old pavement, new pavement, uh, patch pavement, fixed pavement, the sound would be a little bit different because the pavement was different. Um, after being able to take a world tour and do your thing, my friend, you've seen a lot of pavement, more different types and variations of pavement around the world than I have. And you've been up close and personal just as much as I have with pavement, um, <laughs> being that close to the ground. Um, tell me about some of the pavement types, regular black asphalt. I know for sure. Um, you know, that's a lot of the stuff here, limestone rock, sometimes granite rock sand and uh oil and we mash that as much as we can to make it as smooth as we can i noticed that when you get to europe uh it's not always so smooth um can you kind of tell us about pavement types different types concrete all that stuff and you know just kind of that general consensus of what you have experienced uh in your career yeah completely you know for us it's this really intimate relationship with the ground that we have with pavement types and each one of them have a, have a characteristic that have some pros and cons. Um, what I've noticed a lot is cities and townships and counties that have a higher budget obviously spend that money on their roads more than some that don't. Um, so when you go to Europe, it's kind of the same thing. You'd be surprised some places that can get away with high-end maintenance on their roads, closing off a road that might not be necessary for winter so people aren't driving on it, they're not salting it. Oh, really? um, there's some really incredible pavement out there. It's just about where are they spending their budget. Um, and then, you know, the cheap way, I don't know if this is a technical term, but we talk about chip seal all the time mm -hmm. where, uh, where people come in and they take a beautiful blacktop road and they spray some chip seal on top of it. So they think they're making it last longer. It's yep. the lowest budget option that they can. And for us, it makes it rough. It makes it rattly. It makes it slow. You know, yeah. like all racing, smooth is fast. And that is so true with gravity sports. You know, when we're talking about corners and everything like that, if you have something that is blacktop, butter smooth, it's going to rocket you out of the corner because you can stay in your tuck more. You can have a better line. You're not fighting these transitions in the road, these patchwork, you know, everything like that really plays in for what the best line is. Mm -hmm. And I talked about uh, in a, a magazine I'm working with, the Free Red Flyer, talked about reading the road so I'll walk a track I'll start at the bottom or the top and I'll come up and I'll get low and I'll see how the road makes around these corners and and how the grades are how the crest is how the crown of the road and um and then also transitions and things like that and grip I'll put my foot on the on the black top and I'll try to pull it and I'll see if there's a little fine silt layer and my foot just slips or if it's just like tacky sticky kind of glue yeah. And all these things come into play when I'm reading the road. Now, that being said, sometimes there's the rare occasion where those bad transitions and, and patches make it 
extra unique in character. Um, and things don't have to be perfect to be fun, but it definitely helps make you faster if they are perfect. There's right. a road in Southern California that's, uh, it, it makes no sense. They built a new highway around it. They're never going to repave it. It's right on the border with Mexico near Tecate, Mexico. It's called Barrett Junction. And it is the worst pavement I have ever seen, let alone ridden down. There are yeah. potholes everywhere. There's sections that are practically gravel. And meanwhile, you're doing like 60 miles an hour uh, <laughs> happening from the ground trying to avoid potholes. So when you, when you talk about reading a road and you want to straighten out your corners and take that perfect race line, you know, when we come into an event and I walk the track, I see sometimes that perfect race line isn't going to be the fastest. Sometimes I want to go around these potholes or we call it the bacon strips where they're all wavy and pressed up from cars driving over patchwork. And it makes it interesting, it makes it unique, and it brings a whole nother level of how to read it. Now, does that mean I wouldn't want them to repave Barrett? No, I absolutely would love them to repave it because it would make it so much faster. It would make it safer. You know, all these things that are, are welcoming to getting more people into the sport. But it definitely is kind of cool. And that noise you're talking about, it changes with each pavement, whether you have this smooth rocket ship flying past you or a uh, a coffee can full of nails and bolts rolling down the hill and there, <laughs> there are certain tracks that sound like that you just sound you hear the board rattling and bouncing off the ground and and feet skipping across the pavement because there's no place to slowly and smoothly break and <laughs> and at the same time everybody's hooting and hollering and having a great time and the smiles are all around and uh, and it just changes the characteristics now that would never be a world cup level track and right. um, so it's it's something that is just uh, the characteristics of the Southern California events and California outlaw racing series. But I think that's still valuable, you know, and then when I go to places like Kazakov in the Czech Republic, that track gets closed down every winter. There's another way up to the top of the mountain and they protect it in such a level that creates this absolutely perfect racing experience. And the one of the best noises I have ever heard is standing on the side of Kazakov. When you have a group, you know, the free ride runs are multiple people. General racing, you have four people, sometimes six on certain tracks, sometimes two on really technical fast tracks. But you hear this pack of racers flying by you and it's just a, a whoosh, 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 whoosh. Well, Kazakov, all the losers sometimes will go down relatively close and you'll have 30, 40 people side by side at 70 plus miles an hour and it is the Crap. coolest experience just sitting on the side of the road and you feel the wind blowing off of them and you hear their urethane wheels interacting with this perfect blacktop pavement and that's that's just this relationship that wouldn't be possible without people like you that make sure these roads are maintained and you know uplifted and, and held to a certain standard that i think is really important yeah, I mean, you know, when you think about all the different types of pavement, pavement maintenance, um, patching, and not only that, just the different combinations of ingredients that go into making a pavement, right? So and whether that's asphalt or concrete, and I want to ask you about that, the transition, if there is some between concrete and those types of things and painted surfaces and whatnot, because you know, we, we like our street paint here, but in Europe, I've, I've come to find out they really enjoy it. They like it, putting it down thick and heavy <laughs> and a lot of it and a lot yeah. of, different, a lot of different ways too. But I really wanted to touch on, you know, the changes that have been made in pavement preservation at large, not so much in the residential and commercial space, but the municipal state level, that kind of stuff. It's really been crazy because that chip ceiling used to be uh, preservation tactic and technique once a pavement had probably hit 15 or 20 years old, right? So it took it once it was riddled and made it, okay, we're going to glue it together at the surface for a little bit longer so that we don't have potholes and stuff for as long as we can. Um, some places out here where we are in Wisconsin, that'll just be the way it is. They'll gravel a road, then they'll tar and chip it twice, and that'll be quote unquote paved. And it holds up really well out here where we are um, in Wisconsin. But now um, pavement is getting a lot more a lot more interesting because they're using what's called wrap recycled asphalt products. And they're making these pavements that are filled with 
these recycled asphalts. You've seen some of these machines that go along the highway and they're chewing up blacktop, shooting it into a dump truck. They take that recycled or ground up asphalt product, put that back into the same process that would be used to make virgin asphalt. The problem is that oil that they're putting in isn't being absorbed as well as it would have with a virgin rock. It's already been absorbed, right? So the, all they're doing is sticking it back together. It'll absorb a little bit because it's been oxidized, but not as much. So they've been doing that now for roughly 10 years or so, maybe more. But we were, what we're finding is that the asphalt will deteriorate faster now, right? Okay. It just, it, it's, it's not, it's not absorbed and as dense as it would have been regularly. So in order to slow down that process, they chip seal it right away. Like they'll put the black top down, they'll lay it. It'll be perfect. And they chip seal it right away. And you're just like, ah, oh. like, <laughs> oh. like, why, like, why, why do that? Like, why even go through that whole process? Especially when you could just gravel it and tar and chipped it. And I wouldn't be so sad about it, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's definitely noticeable. It's noticeable. It's noticeable when you're driving, right? It's noticeable. I'm a motorcycle rider. So I notice it on my bike, dude. And I'm just like, dude, when I go to a transition of fresh tarnship, I'm like, you, you know, Jesus take the wheel sometimes. I'm like, it, it's, it's, it's dangerous. It's bad. Um, I understand where its purpose is, but um, they're doing it on a brand new drive, brand new highways and roads and stuff. And it doesn't make much sense at all, but that sound changes, right? You can just feel the friction change on your motorcycle tires, right? You, yeah. you hold on tighter, right? You go slower, like it, and it makes you go slower. So, yeah, I mean, the, even the maintenance level changes the levels of those, those pavements and those conditions. But tell me real quick before we jump into like all kinds of conditions and how you adjust your hardware and, and what you're up to for these different types of pavements. The, I want to talk about those concrete transitions and those paint transitions and those types of things real quick. Like, you, like if, you, if you're doing a track walk and I, I want to tell you about my track walk uh, at Ohio, too. But um, if you're doing a, a track walk and you're going down and halfway through it, there's a concrete piece near a corner. Does that change you, change your mind up very much? And then if there's a painted crosswalk or if it's heavy traffic paint on the sides and that's where the good line is and you're like, well, you know, if we're, if we're dry, we're fine. If it's wet, we don't want to be over there. You know what I mean? You read my oh, mind. You read my is mind. that what it is? So, so there are a lot of tracks like that. Um, one that comes to mind is in South America. There's La Leonera in Colombia. And the main hairpin corners are pretty much completely painted. It's big, huge, white border lines um, in the corners. And first day of practice, dry. Everything was fine. I walked the track. I took my practice runs. I started getting faster and faster. And I figured out my race lines. And then qualifying where it's timed runs solo down the hill second day. And it was pouring rain. And suddenly where I could hold a line before was puddling up. And these, uh, these paint sections had zero traction in them. And suddenly I just had to hit the brakes so much earlier. And, and even that in the braking zones were more striped paint lines. And my feet, you know, the paint was almost a half inch thick. They just yeah. laid it on. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, they layer it up. Yeah. And there was just these transitions that every time I would put my feet down or come through a corner, it felt like speed bumps. Yeah. And, um, you know, it changes the mentality of, of the racing. It was more of a survive to make it down the hill and then just try to be in front while people are crashing out around you, um, which I, I'm not a huge fan of. It was a really, really fun track and it made really interesting racing. But the, the pavement painting that they did there made it quite difficult to read. Um, yeah. And then, you know, like you mentioned, there's crazy technology in these things. There's another street luge rider that it was sponsored by an asphalt company in England. Uh, the sponsor was Bitchukem. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that okay. right. Yeah. But they, um, they have everything to like glow in the dark pavement paint, which, um, you know, I've never ridden over it, but it yeah. makes me wonder what the future of our sport is going to be like with these different changes in renewability and the resource availability and how that relationship is going to change with what we're doing because everything that we do is already on this whole system of pre-built roads none of this is built for oh, us yeah. the infrastructure is already there which is great because we can go to places that would never build you know like an ice luge track for 30 people to show up on top of the andes <laughs> but we can go out to peru and suddenly there's these 60 hairpin you know 15,000 foot passes that are just 
dreamy to ride a luge down yeah for now how is that going to be in the future yeah i mean it, it almost puts you in like a tron kind of thought process when i think of it <laughs> when, you, when you talk about the glowing paint like you could totally pull off uh you know glowing sidelines all the way down a glowing middle line and then everybody be having something on the back a color a light or something and you could totally do a night run. Right? We've, done, we've done night runs, and it's yeah. uh, it's always interesting because sometimes with the full moon and a couple street lights, it is really fun and not very dangerous. You can see really well, and then suddenly you get no moon, and you know you go out there in the middle of the night and you can't see anything except what your headlamp illuminates. You know, yeah. some feet in front of you <laughs> at yeah. forty miles an hour. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Dude, it's it's totally cool to think about that futuristic wise, right? Like just man, what 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 could be possible? What is possible? Real quick before we get going, I'll tell you about my track walk and kind of what I what I think may have like adopted me so promptly into the community, right? So I I, I arrived there. Colby kind of introduced me to people. They asked why I was there, or whatever. I go to the top for the per, first practice run, and um, you know on the on the we're in the U-Haul riding up and. Uh, the guy's like, so what are you going to do? And I'm like, well, I'm going to, you know, make a video talking about the pavement conditions and how it affects you guys going down the hill. And then I'm going to come back up and get some shots. And then I may make another video about certain sections of the pavement that are in the track and in the course. And then I'll go about that too. So I took my time making that video going down. They probably did, dude, they had a good run that first day. I think they did probably 15, 18 runs, dude. So they did a really good had a good day i took my time i came down rested one time while they were still going and i went back up again when i came down the second time it was near the end of the day so some of the people were still wanting to go and some weren't the ones that weren't were waiting and asked me like well what do you think i'm like what well, i think what and they're like like you know what's the good part of the track like where where's the good lines so i'm like man i'm I was just kind of doing the pavement conditions, but I can tell you what I know about pavement in general, right? And I went over the the fact that there's going to be four spots in the road all the way across that are more compressed and faster than any other spot. And they're going to be in a line going all the way up and all the way down. So the quicker, if you're going to move from corner to corner and transition to those lines, and those lines are where the tires from all these vehicles have went. Yeah thousands and thousands and thousands of times now if you were to go down the hill on one of those in a straight line versus right next to it you know a foot or two feet the other way in a straight line the one that you're on that's been compressed by road tires should be a lot faster than the other one by the time you get to the bottom right yeah. and then that threw in the mix well what about there was a spot actually where something had happened and they painted it yellow like they're like wanted everybody to be aware, right? Like this is a hazard area and no one could figure out what happened. But I found out what happened, right? I went by it. I've seen it a few times. A vehicle must have stopped there and caught on fire and it had caused mm -hmm. the it caused the pavement to expand. And when it expanded, it not only cooked the oil, but then it made it rabble. It made it very, very rough there. Now mm -hmm. it, it was a good stretch. It was probably it was it was a full length of a vehicle. And that was down the the hill before you get to the chicane. The very first yeah. going down the roller coaster right. section. Right, right. So that whole stretch, you know, everybody's humming pretty good at about the same speed. Yeah, but if you yes, yeah, 60. But if you would hit that spot for 12 seconds and you were half a length in front of somebody and they hit that spot, that could be a full length before you go into the chicane, right? Like yeah, you totally could make the move with that. And that's and that was my that was my kind of my two two cents like hey these are the lines I think it is it's going to be there's not bad conditions but there's one spot here that could be really bad it had actually what we call pushed in a few spots where if you think about it in tectonic plates kind of on a hill I'm sure you've seen it um, some of the pavement will actually want to kind of rise above another piece of pavement right so then they patch that underneath there with coal patch to try to make some kind of a transition. But people were totally getting air, dude. Some of those shots, like people <laughs> getting air, jumping those things, right? Yeah, I've been there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And you're there, you could just totally be like, whoo, you know, and uh, and when you get down there and I'd be like, Did you feel that spot? And I'm like, oh yeah. Like you know, you know all of a sudden when the sound stops for even a millisecond that you're you're airborne. So mm -hmm. um, you know, that was totally, totally cool for me to be able to do that and be there and be like, dude, yeah, that's a good, that's a pretty good evaluation, right? For a track walk. And yeah to understand that 
there's a lot more that goes into it. I think people with an outside eye looking into it are just like, these guys are jumping on and giving her. It's like, no, dude. <laughs> exactly. Like, like there, uh-huh. there's a lot going on. Yeah, yeah. So this event that I'm going to in Argentina, uh, I have never been there, but I've gotten to watch the videos over and over and over again as I try to study it, which is valuable. It also can lead you in the wrong direction if you're watching videos of people that are riding a different style or different lines that you would be. Mm-hmm. But one thing is clear. This track has a lot of corners, but none of them really seem to be hard breaking corners. So it's going to be about the push, about good lines and blocking. And then at the very bottom of the track, there's a bridge, a concrete bridge with expansion joints at the beginning and the end. Okay. And like you said, everybody going over is catching air. And they put this bridge at the breaking zone of a fast corner. Okay. So right where you need to be setting up for a line, right where you want to have the smooth stability of breaking or figuring out your line, you have these little rollovers and everybody is catching air. Now, when you enter the bridge, it's not too bad because you're dropping off of a cliff right. and you're landing on the concrete. But when you exit the bridge, you have this, you know, inch or two lip that your wheels are hitting at full speed. Right. So it throws your line off. You're no longer smooth. You're no longer fast because of that. And it's, um, it's honestly really hard to read because of that. Also, concrete gets dusty. It gets uh, a little bit slippier than blacktops. Mm-hmm. So it's it's uh it's definitely something that I'm trying to consider what the best move is going to be, and <laughs> also keep an open mind of I'm not going to know for sure until I take those first runs. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you take your practice runs and kind of see what's yeah. going on with it. That's the thing between concrete and asphalt, um, the porousness, right? So asphalt, there's always going to have air voids, right? Because we roll it and compress it and mash these hard materials down. Where concrete, it's setting you're getting all the air out of it. So that's completely hard, right? So the, the, any kind of moisture will hopefully uh, go into the pavement or evaporate where on concrete, it's going to sit on there until it evaporates for the most part, right? If they seal it, things like that. So it's totally interesting. I was just thinking like, you know, do you, do you plan to try to set your line hard on the bridge so that when you come out of that, that jump, you're in the best position or do you just give it and then when you land, position yourself then to go into it. You know, it's, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a hard thing to think about. Exactly. So let's really quick then talk about pavement conditions and the adjustments that you make because of it, right? So we can talk about the mindset stuff, right? Or stuff that you know, your awareness of, hey, it's going to be, and we kind of touched on that a little bit. Hey, it's going to be wet. The paint over there on the right is going to be super slick. Yeah. Um, how do you adjust? I seen all kinds of different wheels and people were changing uh, bearings and were they grommets? I think they were like uh, little bushings that are in there. Yeah, some bushings, right? For the different things are, are lean steer. They they compress at different rates, so it changes your stability. Whether you have a really strong center point and a lot of stability, or if you have a really nice smooth dive and you you know you can get into a corner with a lot of agility. Um, I ride for a bushing company called Riptide Sports. And they have the most diverse line of bushings possible, um, which really makes it great because I can now come to a track and bring a couple extra bushings. They're small and they fit in my bag and completely change how my board is going to perform. It's like a race car. If you're changing your, your shock compression and things like that, your tires, um, every one of those factors comes into play. Um, and then as far as wheel shape goes, you know, we can make rain wheels where they have grooves. There's a company that cuts out the grooves. I just do it myself on a lathe and that helps disperse the water out of the way and and gives a couple more sharp edges inside the wheel for traction, just like a car tire. Um, You know, you don't want to race slicks in the rain. It's the same exact thing for us, uh, especially because urethane doesn't grab nearly as well as rubber does. So those, those shapes and factors come into play a lot. Um, I ride for a wheel company, Seismic Wheels, and they have a really diverse lineup of wheels so when I, when I think of track textures, it's our interaction with the world at that point. You know, we're, we're putting our life on the line at sometimes 80, 85 miles an hour. And the only thing that is making that possible is this tiny little contact of these small urethane wheels with the asphalt. Yeah. And, and that can be so different per asphalt um, where really rough things, you need a nice soft compound. So it actually interacts and, and bites into the pavement and you have this compression so everything is really in line and in touch now if you have a, a straight road where you don't have any corners you don't need any grip 
then you narrow up the wheels and you make them really hard. And that's going to give you more straight line roll speed. You're, you're losing less energy in the compression of your wheels. Mm -hmm. um, so before I go to these tracks, I look at what is the track like? How much traction do I need? How much roll speed do I need? You know, is it smooth pavement and I can run a harder wheel? Is it really rough pavement and I need something that's softer just to grab in and make the corners? Yeah. And, um, and I'll, I'll get the wheels that I think are going to work best for me there. Sometimes I've shown up to a racetrack and like I mentioned, those videos, you, you know, you sometimes get a false sense of what it's going to be like. And I got to a couple of places and went, oh, no, I got the wrong wheel. And you just make it work. You know, you do your best. But it's, it's definitely a factor, especially when we're talking you're flying in and you're max weighted out in all of your bags and you have yeah. eight sets of wheels with you and all these bushings and a practice suit and a race suit and your helmet and your luge itself is another 20 something pounds. <laughs> and meanwhile, you're trying to go through the airport carrying three bags in a street luge that's, you know, four feet long. It's, uh, it's not always the easiest thing. And sometimes I wish that I planned a little bit better. But I am really thankful that uh, the companies that are out there supporting the community have thought about this because them two are writers mm -hmm. and they really make sure that they have every option for what's available. Um, the seismic wheels that I ride, they're also a bit up to uh, personal preference. You know, there's other companies out there that make really grippy, hard to turn wheels. Uh -huh. um, they grip more, but they're more like, you know, a big, heavy tank rather than something that's super nimble and more controlling. The, I like a wheel that when I'm on the edge of traction and it's starting to slip and that corner, that sharp little lip of urethane is pressing into the blacktop. Mm -hmm. You know, as I come around a corner, if I need it to lose traction, I can just push it out just a hair and control that slide versus something that's either full grip. And then if you need it to slide, you have to commit to this big honky slide of a oh, wide yeah. contact patch. Um, so it's, it's rider preference and it's, it's experience knowing how to judge a road and, and determine what kind of material and wheel shape and wheel compounds that I'm going to bring. Um, and then a lot of the times I think I have it and I decide not to bring rain wheels and then it starts raining. So, <laughs> you know, prime example is I'm in South Korea and it was a long flight and practice day was great. And then it started raining and I didn't have rain wheels. So you need a lathe to cut these grooves into your wheel. I didn't have a lathe. You know, I'm in the middle of the mountains right. at the Olympic uh, training grounds there for the Olympics. They hosted there, the Winter Olympics. And they happen to have a go-kart track. And mind you, these guys at the go-kart track speak zero English. So I come over there with my luge and a handful of wheels. And I use my hand signals and the Google Translate app to go, hey, can I use one of your go-karts and hold my board up to the spinning wheel when it's on a jack? and use it to power it like a lathe. And then do you have a pocket knife that I can cut? <laughs> the and they laughed and laughed and laughed, but then they helped me because they're, yeah. you know, racers. they like it. They, they yeah. understand that these different things are really important to us. So we did, we sat out there under the overhang of their go-kart track with their go-kart up on a jack and used it to power the wheels still on our axles of our boards with a little handheld Swiss army knife and cut in rain grooves. And then I got on podium, I got third place there. You know, it was it was an incredible experience, and there's absolutely no way that that would have happened if it wasn't for the help of others and being able to change my setup on the fly. Wow, man, and such a good story, right? To be, able, so to be able to fun. tell that story, like, and just be so like, oh, dude, and, and we podiumed, like, I could... <laughs> yeah, it was awesome. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, that makes <laughs> it even it better. Like, dude, we totally redneck ingenuity this thing yeah. and, and made it. Clip. And it was like seven or eight hairpins, and the pavement there, it was concrete. Mm -hmm with these grooves in it like I, mean, yeah. I don't know what it would be for i've only cattle. seen it there it looks like yeah it looked like somebody took a rake down the whole road yeah it's for it's for cattle so a lot of times they'll groove it so that the cattle have something whether they're okay. walking across right or they're walking up most of the time they'll groove it so that it has some kind of foot if they're going to move cattle yeah like, like then they don't slip and fall going down it was, incredible. it was the weirdest experience but it was really fun and <laughs> we were able to make it happen and yeah it, it, it would just change it it also helped the water roll off really well yeah and i think that's the point right of, of whatever they're doing like hey we want to have the water off and create grip for wherever during a cattle yeah. crossing or whatever they're doing that leads me um i have two questions for you um one what about crack sealant like the rubberized crack sealant that you see yeah, people 
Yeah, like what is that? Is it does it give you the same kick? Like when you're on a motorcycle and you hit it, you're like, oh my god. <laughs> um, does it do that when you're on luge too? It definitely does. Um, it, the big issue for me with we just call them tar snakes because of obvious reasons. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And these tar snakes, when you're hitting them, you know, perpendicular and you're going straight and they're just across the road, yep. they're not too bad. You know, you're not on the edge of traction, but like I mentioned, smooth is fast. And if you're in a corner and you hit a patch full of them, it's yeah. going to bounce you around. The other thing is kind of like the crest of a road when you see you guys pave the right hand downhill lane and then yep. you pave the uphill left lane and then that transition down the middle. If you just happen to accidentally find yourself going straight on it, just like a motorcycle on that kind of transition, you yep. get shaken all over the place. It's hard to stay upright and you're on a lean steer vehicle. So as soon as your board starts wiggling, you start pointing all over the place and going yeah. in any which direction. So it, it's really important to know, you know, are these tar snakes in a straight line? Are they at an angle? Are you going to hit them in a straight section or in a corner section? Um, and then also you can see the guys that really care about their work and they put in the time to make it smooth. And then other people just clump it on there hit it with a torch and call it good yeah write their name and draw a little you know yeah yeah smiley face i've seen a handful of them and it's like <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's a this is that international that's international asphalt language <laughs> <laughs> uh, the the other question i had for you was um new pavement versus old pavement right so when we when we talk about the wheel choices and these types of things um on and this is just in my brain the way that i i would think it would work um and let's say there's a both smooth pavements a newer asphalt that had just been paved is going to be stickier because a lot of that asphalt concrete that's in there the black oil that's in there is going to be there if you had a softer wheel on a stickier newer pavement that would be slower than a harder wheel, correct? On that newer pavement. So is that the right adjustment or what do you, do you make an adjustment for that depending on if that's the case? So, so I'll go even more extreme and we'll think about street skateboarding and uh, full concrete parks. Their urethane wheels are incredibly hard. So like a ball bearing, you have a steel bearing and a, you know, a steel ring and that's gonna roll faster, but as soon as you need traction, it's gonna slip. So on blacktop, we run really soft urethane that's uh, really grippy. And the harder the wheel, the faster it's gonna roll. Like you said, the softer the wheel, the more grip you're gonna get. And then as far as the interaction with new pavement, I think from my experiences, there's a fine line. Really freshly paved roads are still leaching out that oil. Yep. You, so they'll tend to be really slippery sometimes, no matter yep. what wheel you have. And then really old roads are rough and you just can't get your wheel to grab in the same amount. So I think there is a sweet spot of a road that has been recently paved. So it's smooth. So it's nice and sticky blacktop, but also it's leached in and absorbed that oil and rained a few times to push out the oil that's sitting on the top. Um, also, if it's a any road and it is the first rain of the season, it's going to push that oil right out of the top and it's going to be slippery so yeah. it, it, it helps if the roads have been washed if there's been a decent amount of rain a few weeks before rather than a lot of traffic on it that's just spitting oil all over the place and then suddenly the first rain happens and we're just hydroplaning across it um, yeah. so i think there's a sweet spot in there somewhere yeah that's uh one of the things i noticed at ohio is they the town brought the street sweeper out like that town uh bainbridge loves i guess must just love the fact that it happens there they, they love it so they'll bring whatever out they needed out there and it was great to talk to the community right that community loved it and the guys were like oh i love seeing these guys i never do it but oh i love watching these guys come out here and do this been watching it for x amount of years and people coming to the end of the driveways and bringing their lawn chairs out and checking it's everything awesome. it's totally awesome spectator sport but for me yeah. but I've even um, seen somebody pull out a, a torch dryer like they use on airport yeah. tracks and stuff like that. So there yeah. was a, a guy that was trying to do a speed challenge in England, and um, I believe he was in England, somewhere in Europe, and the road was wet. And you can't go that fast when the road's wet. So they had a big budget. They were doing a video, and they pulled out those road dryers that is a jet engine with the exhaust pointed straight on the ground mm -hmm. and dried it just as quick as it was getting wet for him. Dude, that's crazy. 
it was incredible stuff. It really was. Like, yeah, go. Yeah, we want to see you go fast as you can. Yeah, exactly. yeah, 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 dude, do it. We'll help you. Yeah, we'll help you. <laughs> Stand back and watch, but you do that. <laughs> yeah, 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 you do that. We'll help you. What else can we do to make you go faster? Yeah, yeah. Awesome. yeah. So, uh, my friend, it's been an uh, an amazingly insightful conversation about your world and uh, and the pavement and everything around it. Real quick, I want you to kind of let everybody know that's been listening um, where they can find you online and, uh, you know, your social tags or whatever. Yeah. And then um, then we'll kind of talk about maybe some other info, too. But real quick before we we'll do that, where can people find you at, Ryan? So my last name is Farmer and I skate down hills. My Instagram and on Facebook, Farming Hills. Um, easiest way to find me is there. You can always reach out. Um with these things, as I mentioned, I rely on support from people and businesses that see some value in investing in what we're doing. Regardless of if I'm going to pay for a road to be paved, I am going to be going down that road and I'm part of the community that shows off what great work you guys do. Um, and these international events are not cheap and USA Skateboarding does not have the sort of budget for it. So it's all out of pocket and with the help of sponsors that find what we're do, find out what we're doing as something valuable for themselves. Um, so I'm happy to provide content, you know, logos, anything like that. Um, so if anybody says, hey, this is cool and this rings with me and you want to be part of the scene, whether you want to get into it and ride down the hill, I have extra gear. Come out and find me. You know, we'll we'll figure something out. I'll find somebody close to you. You know, Farming Hills is my social media. Um, yeah. And I'm I'm always looking to expand our connections with people. So one more thing, um, tell us about World Skate and the info on it and what we can find. My my boy has the Team USA poster hanging up in his... Uh... Yes, I love it. Yeah, so um, essentially our sport is not in the Olympics yet, but like any other sport, once they start recognizing a discipline, they have to look at the other disciplines. So with skiing, you have speed skiing, freestyle, all these types of skiing. Now that there's two disciplines of skateboarding in the Olympics, World Skate hosts those Olympics. They're an international Olympic uh, committee that oversees all disciplines of skateboarding. And now that they have two disciplines in the Olympics, they have to start looking at the other ones, which includes us. So okay. in 2019, it was the first time that Team USA had skateboarders that were doing downhill and street luge. Street luge is just skateboarding that you're laying down on. It's just another discipline of skateboarding. Right. Um, just made to lay down on like a board for the park um so in 2019 i went to barcelona and competed and i got two silver medals there at the first ever olympic organized downhill skateboarding and street luge race which was amazing and it was an honor and now uh it's supposed to be every other year but the pandemic slowed things down so this the second one in argentina uh so i made the team super honored and excited about that and I'm going to be going there to race uh, November 8th through 14th with the Team USA suit. I'm working with Quick Skins suits, which are, they make a lot of other Olympic sports cutting edge. You know, they have their suits in wind tunnels, testing the limits of what's going on. And we're finally making these connections with the outside world, which cool. is great. Um, yeah, I'm really excited about that. Cool, man. Well, I really appreciate it. I'm looking forward to a lot of that stuff. Even the tech stuff, like the suits, like I'll get interested in that, right? Of like, dude, how are we going to apply this to make this stuff even better? And I think once like, once, you know, like you were saying that outside world starting to touch it a little bit and then all of a sudden all it takes is somebody with a little bit of resource, a little bit of insight to be like, oh, dude, we could totally make this or pull this off or, or do this this way or do it better in one way or another. Exactly. exactly. Connections are everything. Oh yeah, dude. That's what people tell me. Your network is your net worth. They say, yeah. well, it, depending on what, <laughs> depending on what you define as your net worth, that can be very valuable. And for me, yeah. a lot of times it's my connections and my friends, right. Just throughout yeah. the world. Like 100%. A full dude, just living a, a full fulfilled life that I enjoy very much is my complete net worth. Like, dude, when I get to the end, I'm like, dang, that was fun. All right. That was full. Uh, that's what I look forward to, man. And it's always about the connections of the community and the friends you make. My friend, uh, thank you once again for joining us. I really appreciate it. Um, you know, hopefully we get to have uh, some people back on here, maybe including yourself um, coming up here within the next year. I'm very excited for downhill, whether it's downhill skate, whether it's street luge, whatever it is. And the fact that our world is somewhat getting back to normal. 
I think we're going to have a lot of highlights, a lot of fun, and uh, a lot of stages that we're going to see all y'all on. So I'm excited for that. Um, any last pieces of advice or any last comments or quotes or anything you'd like to say here before we sign off? You know, I, I just want to say thanks to everybody out there that is putting in the long, hard work days to make these roads possible. Um, you have no idea how far your work goes to different reaches and different sports and just the quality of life of people out there. Your work is meaningful. It, it changes lives. And I just want to say thank you because it changed my life um, all for the better. You know, I really appreciate all the hard work that everybody does out there. Cool, dude. That's amazing. And it will make for a great sound bite for our industry. So uh, <laughs> totally, totally. Thank you very much. All right. For myself and for Ryan Farmer, this is Blacktop Banner. This has been episode 82. And as always here on Blacktop Banner, we speak asphalt. Peace. <laughs>